My name is Brian Delara. Uh, I work as a volunteer at uh, God's House Tower, which is where we are today. We are sat in the library uh, in the uh, lower part of the uh, building. This is a collection of uh, items that we um, ask people to get, donate to the um, to the tower for other people to come and read the history of uh, Southampton as well as the history of God's House Tower. Let me tell you why it's called God's House Tower. If you come along Winkle Street, which is at the back of the platform pub, you'll find a little church, which you cannot get into at the moment. It's called St. Julian's Church. St. Julian's Church was the original church to the priory that was there. Well, sorry, it was a um, monastery. It was a monastic monastery, Augustinian, I believe. Uh, not very big, but it was built in 1196 by a guy called Gervais, who got, later got called Gervais Le Rich. Just means he had lots of money. Um, he then um, put the, the, the tower, it was originally called the Maison Dieu, which in French means God's house. But after um, the tower was put up, of course the tower became known as the tower next to God's house. So it became God's house tower. So it's not religious at all, this, uh, this building is not anything to do with religion at all. So that's how it started. It started life as a defensive tower called the Lambscott. Lambscott Tower, which had a set of stairways going up. If you come up into the Crawford Room, you'll see a set of stairs that go absolutely nowhere. And uh, this was the original tower. And now a few years later, we believe about 1225, um, uh, the um, extension was put on. The extension is where um, the, gal the main gallery is now, and the tower was put on, God's House Tower, which was originally called the Salt Marsh Tower. Now the reason for the gateway here in this building, as you come through the archway, it had portcullises in it. The portcullises were there to keep people in as well as out. You kept people in the town so that they paid the taxes on the goods that they were taking out. It wasn't to stop people going in and out, it was to stop you taking goods in and out. This is not your average loaf of bread, this is your goods, your barrel of wine, and etc, etc, all that was imported into the town. So the town collected taxes. The town collected taxes so they could build more walls. <laughs> Which sounds a bit silly, but originally um, the walls weren't completed till about, uh, let me think, 1400? Uh, because there was a great French raid in 1338 where the French raided Southampton during the first part of the Hundred Years' War. Uh, but instead of coming where the walls were, they came round where the shore way the shore was in the West Quay, where West Quay is now. And of course, there was no defences built there at the time. So they came streaming in the town one Sunday morning, uh, supposed to have gone into St Michael's Church and killed all the people in there. Hence, it was reconsecrated a few years later. Uh, they burnt down a good half of the town. So this is why the Southampton Wars were then, after that time, after the raid, they beat them out and the next day they got rid of all the uh, Frenchmen the next day. But all the inhabitants at that time of the raid ran away. Because obviously if you're not expecting to be attacked, you're, you're not armed in any way. The next day they came back with the, the local militia and from other places and they forced the French out of the town quite easily in fact. But um, from that time, the king ordered all the defence walls to be built in Southampton. This is why we originally we had a complete set of ring walls right in Southampton, which you can now see as a, on the model, which is in um, the tower at God's House Tower. There's a complete model on the wall, uh, about 10 foot tall, of all what, what we believe the town looked like in 1620. So it's at the same year as the Mayflower left. So that's the first part of the tower. The tower was then used, uh, the extension was put on in 1225. Um, as I say, the, um, that was an extension purely for cannons. It was the, one of the very first build, buildings built for use of cannons and, unlike bow, and arrow slits. So all the original um, castles had arrow slits. This hasn't got any arrow slits, this has got gun slits. The main reason being there was no point in firing arrows out into the, in the Southampton water because they weren't, you, weren't, they, you weren't hit anything. So the idea of the cannon was you had a greater range. Or was this improved with time? But also the town gunner was kept here. 
So he was employed, uh, in fact, he was the most well paid employee of the town for some time. Um, he's there's quite a lot of exploits about him um, in the tower, so you can go and find a bit more about the gunners that were here. Um, and then later on in life, the, the 1569, it, it became redundant in effect. And it was used for like somebody rented the tower for um, keeping pigs in it. But uh, in the court leak of Southampton, they actually recorded that um, they kept getting complaints about the smell. It was hardly surprising, keeping pigs in a tower. <laughs> So then the time went on, it was used, then it was used basically as a jail. It had three jails in here. You had a bridewell, a debtor's prison, and an ordinary jail. The ordinary jail was obviously for people who committed crimes, murder, such like. The debtor's prison, it says what it is. You had people who were in debt and couldn't pay their bills, which sometimes happens, and there's some stories of um, merchantmen getting in this position, because obviously they put all their money into... Um, sailing boats and trade and if the boats didn't come back on time obviously they didn't get paid so then there was the bridewell the bridewell was for um, uh, uh, vagrants and people like to be put away somewhere to make the town look better so instead of people sleeping sleeping in doorways and stuff they would collect them and put them in here um, and each prisoner got the blankets and some straw mattresses and stuff which you can read about in, in part of the tower so the, uh, then the tower, it was close to the uh, 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 tower in, in the mid-1800s where they, they built a new prison in Ajuku Park Road, I believe. You'll have to look up Beavis and Ajuku if you've never heard of them. I'll say that again. Beavis and Ajuku who were the, uh, a mythological um, man and his manservant. I won't talk about that, but it, you can, it's very interesting, but it's a very... A mythological story about Sun, about Southampton. Now the tower went on, the God's House Tower then went on to become uh, just a storehouse um, uh, and uh, still owned by the Southampton City Council um, and that went on then it was used by the various uh, um, organisations like ABP or British, before it became ABP the Ports Association used it and then they gave it up in the um, after the war and then the council decided to make this the archaeological museum. And by this time, the floors had all been rotted away, so the new, the current concrete floors were put in, uh, and were used for the archaeological museum from 1961 till 2011, when it closed. When they closed and moved the archaeological department to another part of Hampton. So, uh, and now it's a um, arts and heritage venue for anyone to put a display on here uh, and we have various art um, interpretations going on at the moment and they will change um, in this is now January they will change this month <coughs> on the yelling next month um, so we, we've got that we have the <coughs> art gallery which is a permanent gallery which will ha have different paintings in there uh, this is just for paintings uh, Southampton City Council has loads of paintings, lots and lots of quite important paintings, but they're really, unless you go to the art gallery, um, they're not on display. We're hoping to have different displays out throughout the next few years. So that's the, that's the story so far. But, uh, we also have interesting things like the Crawford Room, where, um, where I normally um, frequent the... Uh, the interesting about the Crawford Room is, well, it's named after a guy called Crawford, OGS Crawford, um, who worked for the Ordnance Survey from the early 20s till he retired. Uh, he started life um, <clears throat> in India, he was born in India, uh, almost immediately sent home to uh, his uh, aunts. His mother died, so they sent him to his, his brother sent him to his aunts in Scotland. He then uh, grew up and went to college and university. But there was no such thing as archaeology when he was um, in the early 1900s when he was doing uh, college work. So he became an anthropologist, uh, which he regretted. He always wanted to be an archaeologist. So then um, he joined uh, up for the First World War. He then got um, into doing the ordnance work. So he would go up a tower and mark out the position of the enemy guns on a piece of paper. 
he would go back to his office and work out where that was on the um, on the maps, draw up a map or a copy of a map to give to the gunners the next day, and they would shoot at these positions. <coughs> um, <coughs> pardon, me, pardon me, he did this for some time, and then the Royal Flying Corps wanted people to do the same thing but from aircraft. So he would go up, he was one of the very first people to go up in an aircraft as an observer, which he did, and he got shot down um, for the first time, uh, and but landed relatively safely, but he got shot in the foot, but he landed on the English side. Um, he came home back to England and spent five and a half months here with his foot being repaired. In the meantime, he had met uh, over in uh, on the front lines of the First World War, he had met H.G. Wells. Uh, so he came and stayed with him for a while uh, back in England. He then went back after he was um, foot was repaired and um, went went flying again. But this time he got shot down again. This time he landed, unfortunately, on the German side. So he was captured <coughs> and put at a concentration camp. But he was only there a few months before the end of the war. Um, he then went on to join the Audit Survey when he returned to England after the war. Um, basically to put uh, monuments on the Ordnance Survey maps. So he was the man that put Stonehenge um, and all these different places on the Ordnance Survey map. Before, before that time, it was just an M, which meant monument. So he went out and drew the stones and actually <coughs> but came back and then they put the, the, the uh, people actually drew them on the maps. Uh, he was a, one of the key guys that did aerial photography because they started aerial photography um, at the end of the South First World War he then um, knew the people that were doing it because it was done by the same organisation the Royal Observer Corps so he went up to see them because he knew some of the pilots obviously from the First World War and took them into doing different areas of the country because they would go out and practice so they would go out and practice their techniques and what they could learn from aerial photography but also in different places. So he discovered things like the walkway from the River Avon up to Stonehenge. He discovered Woodhenge on the maps. So he discovered an awful lot from these photographs that he then put on maps. He would go and measure them and, and then put them on the maps. So he did this for many, many years until he retired. Um, he lived in um, uh, North Baddersley where he died when, at the age of 71. Go to the museum, Go, come to God's House Tower, come to Tudor House, come to the Aviation Museum, because that's very historic as well as um, modern stuff. Um, there's an awful lot of history around it. A recommendation is to go and do one of the guided walks. There's a thing called the Southampton Tourist Guide Association. We're on the internet, the Southampton Tourist Guide Association. If you contact them via the internet, uh, all their walks are on there. You can pay online. Um, most of them start currently at the bar gate. And I think they're on a Saturday or a Sunday morning. And it's a very interesting, well-informed guide of what guides you around. Uh, mostly the old walls of Southampton. But they do do different tours throughout the year. They do a ghost walk, do a cellar tour. They do lots of different walks. So contact the Southampton Tourist Guide Association for guided walks. <coughs> Well, I've got me into it, but I like, I like medieval history. I have done for many, many years. And my wife and I, when she was alive, um, used to go and visit medieval churches all around this area. Um, and there are, there are a lot of them um, in southern New Hampshire. Um, all places, you know, Minstead, um, uh, Lymington uh, is, a, is a medieval church. They're all over the place. They might not look medieval, some of them, but they are. there are many of them that are getting on for a thousand years old. I mean, I lived in High, and there was um, Didman Churches, um, for example, is a medieval church built in 1150, same as the one at Forley. Didman Church, historically, isn't, it was rebuilt after the First World War. It was the first church to be bombed during the First World War, the Second World War, sorry. So there's a, and of course, it had only had an incendiary device, but because it's a medieval building and basically a timber frame on top of a stone building, it just caught the roof caught fire and by the time somebody saw the smoke that was the end of it really. Forley was lucky, it, it did get a, a, a attacked but they managed to put the fire out before it really got hold. 
but there are um, a lot of history in Southampton. St Michael's um, <coughs> church um, got to, got to damaged. It didn't get hit, but it got damaged from blasts close by. Um, there is a story going around that St Michael's church was used as the um, focal point for the bombers. So they would use the tower, because it was obviously highly visible, being a nice high tower. Not They were ordered not to bomb it, so it was said, because they wanted that as a landmark. So they would fly round it rather than hit, try and hit it quite successfully, unfortunately. I mean, the town was rated as one of the best towns in Southampton prior to the Second World War, so it's a real shame that we've lost it. But there's a few bits and good bits and pieces now, now left, so... I'd recommend going to the museums uh, at Southampton yeah. and keeping your eye on the internet, see what else is open. Sometimes they open the bar gate for special events um, and, and uh, music events, stuff like this. Yeah, come to Southampton. I mean, you know, even just come to the bar gate and walk around. I mean, uh, I would recommend the, the, um, the thoroughly recommend the talks, the Southampton Tourist Guide. Um, they spend an awful lot of time learning all about the town and uh, some quite interesting little anecdotes that they they use and even if you do the same tour with a different guide the, the guiding is not such that it's a, like a regimented um, it's not a regimented talk so one guide gives up they'll give the same sort of information but not necessarily the same thing because we're, they're not trying to follow a story as such uh, they do the same walk and they'll go in the same vaults if they're open I mean going in the, the King's Vault and the Undercroft and place of this you cannot get in there unless you go on a tour guide so my recommendation out of all this is to go on a tour guide and they'll show you most of this stuff um you know Canute's Palace um which is not was never nothing to do with Canute but it's called Canute's Palace so I would that's my recommendation